Good morning, Brands. As we come to a close of Matthew 24, we've been kind of finishing up this series here. The Lord is giving His disciples a parable here in the end. And He's giving them a parable to push home the truth that they need to watch for His coming. Now remember, the Lord is here in Matthew 24. He's talking to His disciples. They have asked Him questions concerning the destruction of Jerusalem. The destruction of the temple, the parousia, and the end of the Jewish age. Their question was basically twofold. They said, when will these things happen, and what signs will precede them? And so Yeshua has given them several signs. He told them that the gospel would be preached in all the world, in verse 14. He told them they would see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel, in verse 15. He told them they would see the great tribulation, verse 21. And that they would see the collapse of heaven and earth in 29. Thus ending the Jewish age and manifesting the parousia of Christ. Yeshua told them all these things would happen in their generation. Pretty important verse that most people seem to miss. Truly I say to you, this, not that, this generation, the near demonstrative, the generation I'm talking to. A generation is about 40 years biblically, so they knew that the Lord would return in their lifetime, but they didn't know the day or the hour. And that's what Yeshua said in 2436. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. They didn't know the day or the hour, but they knew it would be in that generation. Now, because they didn't know the day or the hour, Yeshua told them they need to be ready. They need to be watching. In verse 42, therefore stay awake, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. Now, in light of his coming in judgment on Jerusalem, Yeshua cautions his disciples to stay awake. Now, this exhortation, stay awake, is not given to 21st century Christians. It's given to the people he was talking to, his disciples, first century Christians. And we need to understand this or we're going to really get messed up on what's happening here. All right? He's telling them, stay awake. Now, the words here, stay awake, are the Greek word, Gregorio. And it means to keep awake, to watch, to be vigilant, to be on the alert. I think this is better translated, would be better translated, be on the alert. All right? I think that because to me, there's people who are awake that are not too alert. Right? They're awake. They're, you know, we think of just being awake, but they're not too alert. So, and this is in the present imperative, meaning to be constantly on the alert. Now, would it make sense for Yeshua to urge his disciples to be constantly on the alert for something that wasn't going to take place? For over 2,000 years. Does that make any sense to anybody? Now, you know, we talked last week about the fact that some people want to divide Matthew 24 from verse 36. The verse up to verse 36, they say that's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Verse 36 on, it's talking about a future coming. So the Lord's telling, he's talking about a future coming here, and he says, be alert. Because in a couple thousand years, I'm coming back. Well, they would say, what's that got to do with us? I mean, if we were to hear, scientists are saying there, there is a meteor coming to hit earth. And we need to get ready. We need to be prepared. But they said the meteor is not coming for probably 2,000 years. Would you, be, would you care? Would you care what they had to say? Be alert. You guys got to be alert. Why? We're not going to be around then. That would be just dumb. Who cares? It's that long away. Good. We, we don't care. All right. But some think that, yeah, he was talking to people in that day, telling them to be alert for something they would never see. Cook writes this, The use of the second person does not necessarily imply, as Meyer maintains, that our Lord represents his presence in judgment as coming during the lifetime of his disciples. Uh, I think it does. They, like the rest of mankind, are to be kept in ignorance of that day, this very ignorance is to be the ground of their watchfulness. They just don't know, so watch. And it is equally their duty, and that of all men, to watch. 
whether the day is fixed in God's counsels within their own lifetime or not. So watch. And I've had people, when I, first time I preached this message about the return of the Lord in my former church, we had a, a couple stand up and say, well, he told them to watch because he wanted every generation to be ready. And I said, so he told them to watch knowing they weren't going to see any of this stuff. So basically he's lying to them. Okay? You're not going to see this, but watch anyway. He wanted every generation to watch. And I'm like, that sound okay to you? And they're like, ah, it makes sense to us. I think the second person does imply that he was speaking to the disciples. But we don't need an implication because we have plenty of clear evidence that he was going to come during their lifetime. He told them this, people. It's not hard to see it. Look at Matthew 16, 27 and 28. The Son of Man is going to come with his angels and the glory of his Father, and he will pay each person according to what he has done. All right. MacArthur says this speaks of the Mount of Transfiguration that happened six days later. Uh, did he repay every person according to their works? Was there any judgment then at all? Truly I say to you, yeah, weren't any angels there? Truly I say to you, there are some standing here. Some of you people I'm talking to. You're not going to taste death until you see the Son of Man come in His kingdom. So he's telling the disciples, you're still going to be here. Now, are they still here? I've had some people tell me, yes, they believe some of these disciples are still waiting. So you got okay, you're okay with 2,000-year-old disciples hanging around waiting for this, but you're not okay with the Lord meaning what He said and coming in that generation. The Lord told them He would come in their lifetime. Listen, they didn't know the day or the hour, the first century Christians, and they were always to be watching. But since we know that the day was fixed in their lifetime, it was that generation and that generation alone that was to be on the alert for His coming. There would be watched for His coming in judgment upon the wicked city of Jerusalem. Israel's house was going to be destroyed. Christians who were alert could escape the judgment on this city by fleeing from it, as their Lord had instructed them. We studied this many weeks ago, Matthew 24, 15 through 18. So when you see the abomination of desolation, what is that? Do anybody remember what that was? We said that was? That's the Roman army surrounding the city with their ensigns coming into Jerusalem. All right, when you see that, you see your city surrounded by armies? Okay, that's a good clue, right? Spoken of by Daniel the prophet, in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. People, that's so simple, but t people today are saying, oh, it's going to be worldwide, the whole earth is going to experience this. What good's it going to do you to go to the mountains then? He's talking to the people in Judea because this is a local judgment. You flee, you get out of there. Let the one who's on the housetop not come down to take what's in his house, and let the one who's in the field not turn back to take his cloak. In other words, don't grab anything. Don't Just get out of there so you can save your life. The lives of those early Christians were dependent upon their watchfulness. They were to be watching for the Lord's coming in judgment on apostate Israel. Now, before we go any further, let me ask you a question. Who was to be watching and alert? Okay, so he's talking to Christians, first century Christians, but Christians, he's telling them to watch and be alert. alert. That's who he's talking to. Well, let me show you that, Matthew 24, 43 through 44. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he'd have stayed awake. He would not have let the house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming, at an hour you do not expect. Now this comparison of the Lord's coming with that of a thief in the night is found many places in the New Testament. And as we look at these different texts, please keep take note of who is being addressed here, who he's talking to. Paul exhorts them to be always ready for the coming of Christ in judgment, which would be suddenly, it would be a surprise. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. You yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now, who is he speaking to? Brothers. Christians. He's warning. This letter is written to the Christians. 
How did they know this? Well, they knew because they had the Lord's Sermon on the Mount of Olives. Some of them were there. Now, the phrase, the day of the Lord, is an expression taken from the Tanakh. It's used many times as regards to, it speaks of judgment that God brings upon various nations. It usually meant a time when God himself would punish or judge people by the means of armies of other people. And God says, I'm doing this. I'm bringing this. If you read through the Tanakh, you see it over and over. And God stirred up the Medes and he stirred up and he brought them in as judgment to destroy those nations that he wanted to. That's called the day of the Lord. Now, while the various references to the day of the Lord in the Tanakh referred to various nations, the reference in such expressions in the New Testament referred to strictly to A.D. 70. A lot of different judgments we see in the Tanakh, but when he says it in the New Testament, it's reference to A.D. 70 when the nation Israel was to be destroyed. So the phrase, the day of the Lord, refers to the destruction of Israel by the Roman armies. And Paul says here it will come like a thief in the night. Now that's something, you know, you've got to be prepared for. And we can see by comparing the Thessalonian passage with Matthew 24 that the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman armies in A.D. 70 and the coming of the Lord are synonymous. They're synchronous events. All right, look at Thessalonians 5, 3 and 4. While people are saying there's peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come on them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they will not escape, but you are not in darkness for that day to surprise you. Now, notice the they and them here. He says, the people are saying, and the destruction will come upon them, and they won't escape, but you. You, you're different. That day won't surprise you like a thief. The Lord is a thief in the night to those who are not watching. Therefore, Christians are admonished to watch. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be, keep awake and be sober. Now the word here, awake, is Gregorio. It's the same word our Lord uses in Matthew 24. Peter uses the same idea of the Lord coming as the thief of the night in 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and its works that are done in it will be exposed. So Yeshua used it. Paul used it. Peter used it. John uses it when he's quoting Yeshua in Revelation 3.3. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what hour I come against you. So he's saying, you've got to pay attention. He comes like a thief. They're not watching. Wake up here is Gregorio again. All right? And in Revelation 16, 15, he says, Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeps his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be exposed. All right, again, so Christ is coming as a thief, and they're blessed if they're watching. Stay awake here, Gregorio again. Now, common in all these passages is the idea of suddenness, unexpectedness of the coming, and consequently the danger of unpreparedness on the part of those in the first century saints who saw the promise of his parousia fulfilled. Now, the idea of a thief with us, I think we get the idea of somebody just taking something that doesn't belong to them, all right? Without doing any violence, they do it secretly, they do it silently, they're just a thief. But the original word means one who does it by housebreaking or highway violence. In other words, there's often, you know, this is a traumatic thing, taking your stuff. Yeshua had told them he was coming, and they were to be expecting it. They were to be prepared for it. Now, if a man knows the approximate time that a thief may be coming to break in his house, he takes precautions, and he prepares accordingly, right? You get a phone call, hey, guess what? The thief's coming to your house tonight. Okay, cool, I'm ready. Bringing them on, all right? Let me illustrate this to you. <laughs> when I was in youth work, several of the teens would come to my house in the middle of the night and would cover my trees with toilet paper, okay? 
the precious little darlings would also take my wood pile and they would take the logs and they would just post, place them all over the yard. So I would get up in the morning, you know, I'm ready to get up, get into my studies and I look outside and I'm like, and it takes me hours to clean this up, all right? It takes me hours to clean this up. And this happened on several occasions. You know, it takes a lot less time to put toilet paper in a tree than to get it out, okay? <laughs> So this, they did this on several occasions, and to say the least, I wasn't too thrilled with their expressions of love, all right? I uh, just really wasn't, but they did it affectionately. One night before a big youth activity, I received an anonymous, anonymous phone call from a mother telling me the teens were going to TP my house that night. I was so excited. <laughs> I waited up all night. I went to the front bedroom of our house, which was a spare bedroom. I opened the window. I sat there on the floor, and I just waited. <laughs> Every time I heard a noise, I'd be looking out there. I think I fell asleep a few times, but I got up quickly anytime I heard some kind of noise. All right, I mean, I was ready. I was waiting. But they never came. Nobody showed up. I was disappointing. So I was pretty tired in the morning. I, you know, got ready and went to the youth activity. You know, we had buses there to take the kids to the activity. So I'm standing on the bus, and one of the teens walks on, and he has this big smile on his face, face and he says, did you get a good night's sleep last night? <laughs> oh, I could have just ripped his head off. <laughs> but they got me, and that's what I told him. I said, oh, you got me. You got me good. You know, they knew I wanted to catch him. So, the, you know, I didn't get any sleep, Okay. <laughs> Well, listen, the Lord is not like those kids, okay? He wasn't, he wasn't pulling a prank on the first century saints. He told them to be alert because he was going to come in their generation and destroy Jerusalem and that old covenant system, and he did. Now, go back to the youth story. We're in bed, sleeping, and all of a sudden we hear this. I don't know how, I don't know if Kathy woke me up or what, but you hear the rolling down the roof, the toilet paper rolling down the roof of the house. So I peek out the blind and I see him out there. And I'm just, okay, so I go from a dead sleep to a hard run. Because when I ran out the door, they scattered. And I, we ran through several yards and I finally caught one of them. And I dragged him back to the house, you know, by his head like this, you know. And I was going to call the cops. My wife goes, it's a joke. I'm, it's not funny. <laughs> And I let them go, we, but I don't think I got TP'd after that, but they really did think it was funny, you know? But like I said, that's a, when you have to spend a couple hours in the morning cleaning up, you didn't think it was funny, all right? But again, the Lord's not like them. He wasn't trying to set them up. He was coming. Now, in verse 44, the Lord says to his disciples, therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, the Greek word here for ready it's hetoimos from the noun, and it means to be ready, be prepared. Luke puts the same warning this way. Luke says, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Let me say something here about this. Okay, that sounds like, wow, that's going to be everybody, right? Does that sound like that? Well, whole earth here is a bad translation, in my opinion. All right? It's translated from the Greek word gay. And gay would be best translated here, land. And here it refers to Jerusalem as the context demonstrates. And I'll show you that in a minute, but let's finish the verse. He says, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. All right, so the context here of the whole earth, we back up. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. That's kind of a no-brainer, right? We see the armies surrounding it. We're in trouble. The subject here is Jerusalem, not the whole earth. They would always be watching and praying that they would be able to escape the coming judgment on Jerusalem. Because if they got caught in that city, they're going to be destroyed. Now, to drive home the need of watchfulness, the Lord gives His disciples a parable to contrast the difference between what would become of those who are watching and what would become of those who are not watching. So He's using this parable. 
And he says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant who his master has set over the household to give them their food in the proper time? Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, My master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants, and he eats and he drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, at an hour when he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. And that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I think this parable intensifies the need to watch. The contrast here is extreme. Those who are faithful servants are blessed. They're put in charge of the master's goods. Those who are not faithful are cut in pieces. That's a strong contrast, right? All right, let's talk. Let me say a word here about parables. A parable is a brief story or a narrative drawn from human life or from nature and not relating to some actual event, but true to life and concerning something very familiar to the listeners given for the purpose of teaching a spiritual truth. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The etymological meaning of the word parable is a placing alongside for the purpose of comparison. The intention of parabolic teaching is given by Christ in Matthew 13, 11 through 17. He says, first, it's a method of teaching the responsive disciple. And second, intent of the parabolic teaching is to hide the truth from the unresponsive and so aids in the hardening of their heart. Bernard Ram, in his book, Protestant Biblical Interpretation, which is a book on hermeneutics, very good book, says this, the golden rule of parabolic interpretation is determine the one central truth the parable is attempting to teach. Practically all writers on the subject mention it with stress. Dodd writes this, the typical parable represents one single point of comparison. The details are not intended to have independent significance. That's so important with parables because people want to take parables, well, this thing means this, and this over here means that, and they get this huge, elaborate thing. No, it's teaching you one central truth. Other writers have put it this way. Don't make a parable walk on all fours. Okay? So our objective as we study the parable is to find its one central message. And I think it should be clear that this parable is an amplification of the word which our Lord gives to His disciples. Watch. Be on the alert. That word is stressed throughout this whole passage. It's one command Yeshua gives to those who are waiting for His coming. This parable tells us what it means to be alert. What did our Lord mean when He said, be alert? The Lord did not mean that they're to be standing, you know, gazing into the sky or whatever. That's not the idea. That's not what he's talking about. He meant that they were to live the life of faithfulness to his commands. The word then indicates connection with the preceding verse, as if to say such readiness implies faithfulness. The ever-present anticipation of his return was to keep them faithful in the midst of apostasy that surrounded them. So they were to keep their eyes on the Lord. They were to be ready. Lang says, watching is here indicated in its concrete form as fidelity to the calling. Now in this parable, we have a household whose master is away, and the household is waiting for him to return. The master has appointed certain servants and given them responsibility during his absence. The only activity mentioned is that of feeding the household. These servants have the primary important task of feeding the household at the proper time. That's what they're supposed to do. That is the first and essentially what the idea of watching is. Taking care of the household. Feeding the household. So watching included feeding and being fed by the Word of God. I think that's the emphasis here because we're fighting apostasy. I think it's obvious in this parable. Now, the household must be fed the Word of God or they will out of ignorance turn back to Judaism and be destroyed in its fall. And that was the great danger then. You know, the Judaizers are out there trying to stir the Christians up, trying to get them to go turn back to Judaism. I think that's basic, that's fundamental. If they don't eat, they're not going to survive, they're going to perish. 
They can do nothing else until they have established the health and strength by eating. Now, to feed the flock was the primary responsibility of church leaders. To feed them so they'd have an understanding, not turn back to apostasy. Look at John 21, 15 through 17. When they had finished breakfast, Yeshua said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. So he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Yeshua said to him, feed my sheep. So in this text, three times Yeshua says, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. One of those times, the middle time, he uses the word poimeno. Poimeno means to shepherd. But the first and the third time, he uses the word bosco not poimeno. The verb bosco is used both literally and figuratively for feeding animals, providing nourishment, while the verb poimeno includes all the duties of a shepherd, you know, taking care of the flock, protecting the flock. But one of the main responsibilities of the shepherd was to feed the flock. That was his primary duty, feed the sheep. Look at Acts 20, 27, 28. Paul here is talking to the Ephesian elders, he had them meet them. He had them meet him, and he's talking to you. He says, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. When I was with you, I taught you everything. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So Paul taught them the word of God, and Paul tells these elders that their task is to care for the church of God. The word care here is from the Greek word poimeno, which means to shepherd. And I think shepherding can be boiled down to feed and lead. Teach the Word of God and live out a godly example. The Puritans spark renewal in a large part through their commitment to preaching as the pastor's primary task. Can you imagine that? How dumb is that? Huh? J.I. Packer states this. To the Puritan, faithful preaching was the basic ingredient in faithful pastoring. And then he cites from John Owen, who wrote, The first and principal duty of a pastor is to feed the flock by diligent preaching of the word. This feeding is of the essence of the office of pastor. Now, as the early church was taught the truth of the new covenant, they were being protected from apostasy. They were learning that they should be watching and be ready and what the signs were. The Word of God is truth. It is the unveiling of reality. It is the revelation of the way things really are. Thus, if you're going to live, you have to know what life's all about. To know the way things really are. That is why the Word is the food. It is referred to as such in many places in Scripture. In his first letter, Peter exhorts it exhorts the believers, he says, like newborn babes, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. There's a certain quality about the Word of God that's like milk to a baby. It feeds, it establishes him. In other places, the writer of Hebrew mentions that strong meat of the Word of God. He says in 5, 12 through 14, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk and not solid food. He goes, you guys should be more advanced than you are. You're still a bunch of babies, okay? You're still in the bottle, and you need to be eating solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he's a child. So they needed milk. They, they weren't growing up. He says, but solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. See, people, understanding the Word of God, it touches everything. You can never understand life unless you understand the Word of God. Paul told Timothy that in order to prevent apostasy, they needed to continue in the Word and in doctrine. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit expressly says in the latter times some will depart from the faith devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons. 
In the end times, there's people going to depart. They're going to leave the faith. So what are you supposed to do, Timothy? Drop down to the end of the chapter. He says, until I come, Timothy, here's what you do. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. Read it to exhortation. Explain it to teaching. Teach the Word of God. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching. Pay attention to what you're teaching. Why? Persist in this, for by doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. See, Timothy would save himself and his hearers from apostasy if they continued in the Word of God. The faithful servants are those who are involved in teaching the truth of Scripture. Now, notice that the faithful servants are blessed in this parable because of their faithfulness. They're made rulers over the master's goods. We see this principle fleshed out, I think, in many saints throughout the Tanakh. You know, Joseph is just one example of this. It says, so Joseph found favor in, the, in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. He's supposed to be being in prison. When he's in prison, he's running it. He gets out of prison, and he's running the whole country. All right? He was faithful to God, and God blessed him. And it's not only Joseph. We see that in the life of David and Daniel and Esther. They became subjects. They, more than subjects, they became representatives and leaders in their master's household. So this parable was to the first century disciples in view of the coming of the Lord. But I think there's application to us in the sense that we are also called to be faithful to the Word of God. And that we have to be students of the Bible. If we're going to understand what's going on in life, if we're going to understand our purpose and what God wants for us, we have to be in the Word of God. And there's a truth here that God rewards faithful servants. I think that still applies to us. And as we spend time in the Word of God, we're going to be strengthened in our faithfulness and thus rewarded by our Lord. There's nothing more important, people, that we can do than be in the Word of God. Nothing. Now, in contrast to the faithful servant, there is the unfaithful servant. He says, but if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed, he begins to beat his fellow servants, and he drinks with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come in a day when he does not expect, in an hour he does not know, and he'll cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites in the place where he's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, notice that the wicked servant says, my master is delayed. The wicked servant then proceeds to beat his fellow servant, he eats and drinks with the drunkards. But to the surprise of the wicked servant, the master returned when he didn't expect him. And he says he's going to come in a day and an hour. Now, is that, remember the context we just looked at last week about the day and the hour. You don't know the day or the hour is coming. So he's taking this parable and he said they didn't know when the master was coming. Didn't know the day or the hour. The master didn't return and cut the wicked servant's distant relatives in pieces. He cut them in pieces. Okay? The wicked servant was alive when the master left. The wicked servant is alive when the master returns. Okay? He's the one that's being... So this is not talking about something thousands of years away because there'd be no point in telling him this. In this context, delayed. It says, well, see, he's delayed. Well, 2,000 years is a long delay. Okay? I think the delay has to be measured by a person's life, all right? In context, two years could be considered a long time if the master usually returned in six months, right? And it's not hard to imagine that the passage of several decades would lead some to doubt the reliability of the prophecy, especially as promised generation was coming to a close. Well, he said it was going to happen this generation. But then the events of A.D. 70 silenced those who were thinking that way. So this wicked servant fails to feed the household of God. The Lord tells him what happens. He begins to beat them. He begins to beat his fellow servants. He indulges his own appetites to extremes. He eats and drinks with the drunken. When the master returns, he finds the man failing at his primary task to feed, and he is destroyed. He's cut in pieces. It's quite a contrast to the blessing received by the faithful servant. One was ready, watching and faithful. The other's not ready, not watching. He's unfaithful. Now, here's the question we have to answer. Who is the wicked servant? Let me make it simple for you. Make it a multiple guess. 
Christians, non-Christian. Huh? <laughs> A multiple guessing, you got it wrong. You're getting an essay next time, all right. <laughs> Listen, many say this represents an unbeliever and their punishment in hell. Does that fit the context? Let me ask you something. Who is told to watch to be alert? Christians, Christians right? Are unbelievers told to watch? Why would he tell them to watch? They don't care. No, it is believers who are to watch for His coming. In Matthew 24, we know that the Lord is talking to His disciples. Notice what Luke adds. But know this, if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. And Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? So you got to be ready, and then Peter asked this, is this just for us, us disciples, or for everybody? And everybody, he means all Christians, all right? Well, the Lord really doesn't answer Peter. He goes on and gives the parable that we're looking at in Matthew. But Mark says this, be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves his home, he puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore... Stay awake, all right? For you do not know when the master of the house will come. In evening, or midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. But what I say to you, you disciples, I say to all, stay awake. So he's talking to all Christians. He's addressing all believers when he says watch. He warns them not to get caught up in sleeping, but to be watching. The idea of sleeping is not to be taken literally here, people, okay? I think the idea is that of morally sleeping, not being faithful to the Word of God. The idea is seen in many places in the New Testament. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God. That's simple, right? Believers, that's our calling. Just imitate God. Do what God does. As beloved children, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for a fragrant offering, a sacrifice to God. So Paul is here exhorting the believers to walk in love. Walk is referring to their conduct. They're to put away sin. They're to walk in holiness, says in verse 3. But sexual immorality, impurity, covenants must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. They are to do this because they are light and they are to live as children of light. He says in verse 8, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. They're light. That's their position. That's their identity. Because of who they are, they're to live like that. That is to be their practice. 14 says, For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Remember, he's talking to believers here, all right? He's telling believers, wake sleeper, rise from the dead, he'll shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So wake those sleeper, again, talking to believers. Now, the Greek word used here for sleep is kathudo. It means to lie down to rest. By implication to fall asleep. It's literally, it can be literal or figurative. This is the same word used by Mark. This is a call for believers to watch, to wake out of sleep, to be aware of what's going on. He is speaking about their conduct. They are to wake up and be careful how to walk their practical lives. Notice also in Thessalonians. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, we have no need to write anything to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. They knew that. While people are saying, there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them like in labor pain. So the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief. So he's telling them to be prepared, be ready. It's going to come upon, like a, coming upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, that that day should surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light. So don't let that day surprise you. You're children of light. You're children of the day. We're not of the night. We're not of the darkness. Again, he affirms their identity, their position. They are children of light, and because of that, they are to stay awake. 
Now watch verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 here. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. So then, because of who we are, don't sleep, but keep awake. Here, sleep here is kathudo, and the word keep awake is gregorio. They're the same words that our Lord used in the parable of the wicked servant. It is believers who are not to sleep. In verse 7 through 9, he says, For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath. All right? They, believers belong to the day, so God has not destined them to wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Yeshua the Christ. The wrath here is not speaking of judgment in hell. It's the destruction of Jerusalem that they can escape if they pay attention. Now notice carefully what he says in the next verse. Who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Who did the Lord die for? His elect, right? Believers. All right? Now, these are the same Greek words here. Awake is Gregorio, and asleep is Kathudo. So to believers, to the elect, he says, if they awake or sleep, they're going to live with him. Because believer, if you're a believer, you can mess up all you want in this life, and you're still going to be with him. The difference is if they sleep, they're going to suffer great harm physically because of it, because they're not paying attention. They're not listening. What he's trying to tell them. Revelation 3, 3, Remember then, when you received and heard, keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I'll come to you like a thief. Now, the word if here is a third class condition. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. If those in Sardis don't wake up, Christ's going to come to them as a thief. It's speaking of judgment. If they watch his coming, won't be a surprise. They'll be ready. Let's go back to our text and see what happened to the wicked servant. And he will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, he's cut in pieces. <laughs> that is physical punishment, people. Okay, you agree with that? Cut in pieces, that's physical punishment. <laughs> it doesn't say he's a hypocrite, but he's going to share their punishment. So, and then many see this weeping and gnashing of teeth here. They say, oh, this is definitely a reference to hell. I think it's a picture of pain and torment that was experienced in the Jewish war in AD 70. In Luke's version of the parable of the wicked servant, he records Yeshua as saying this, I am come to cast fire on the earth and would that it were already kindled. Talking about Jerusalem and the destruction that'd be... And listen, if they weren't watching, if they weren't ready, if they ran into that city, they were going to suffer horribly. You need to read Josephus' War of the Jews. And he talks about what happened during the siege. He talks about women eating their own children. He talks about all the murder that went on in there, all the suffering. Can you, I, can you even fathom that, eating... Your own children, you're, you're so miserable. I mean, they're being slaughtered. The people that weren't killed were taken off into slavery. It was a horrible, horrible time. And the Lord's telling them, He's trying to emphasize the pain if they're not paying attention. The fire that the Lord kindled is on gay, the land. He's referring to judgment at the hand of the Romans each time the phrase weeping and gnashing of teeth is used, it's used in relation to Israel and their punishment for rejecting Christ. Their city was burned. It was destroyed forever. He says it in 8.12. He says, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness, the place they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, they're caught in Jerusalem because they're not listening. Matthew 22.13 then the king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him to outer darkness. That place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's pain involved in disobedience. There's our text there about weeping and gnashing of teeth. In 2530, he says, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Luke 13, 28, in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourself cast out. 
In this closing section, Yeshua is again stressing the need to watch and be ready for His coming. And why would He do that if they weren't going to see it? Now, I'm not, you know, as He's talking to them, what in His mind He's saying, this doesn't really apply to you. But in thousands of years, someone's going to read this and it's going to apply to them. No, that's not at all. He's talking to them. When they see the signs, they are to flee from Jerusalem. Go to the mountains. And if you turn back, you're going to be in trouble. You'll greatly suffer. And he says in Luke 17, 32, remember Lot's wife. He would come in their lifetime, bring destruction on Jerusalem. If they were faithful and watched, they'd escape. And many of the Christians did escape. They escaped to Pella. There are some people who teach that no Christians got caught in Jerusalem. I don't believe that for a minute. I think a lot of them got caught. They, they saw Jerusalem surrounded by armies, and a lot of them ran into Jerusalem instead of running away. But all of this underscores the importance of feeding on and knowing the Word of God. This is the whole thrust of the parable. It's what the Lord wants to emphasize. What does the Word of God accomplish that makes it so absolutely fundamentally necessary? The Word of God reveals Yeshua as the Savior of all who will put their trust in Him. In John 5, 39, talking to the Pharisees, Yeshua said, You search the Scriptures, the Tanakh, because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about Me. And so the Word of God strengthens and refreshes the human spirit. That's the primary purpose. It does nothing else than that. It achieves a major task in your life. If that's all it does, it's not to give us information primarily. It's to help us see a person. That's the Lord Yeshua. What the Son says to us is the ultimate revelation of life. To see the Son through the medium of the Word of God is to find your own heart attracted and drawn to this marvelous personality, this magnificent one, this spotless, unsullied Son of God in all magnificence and strength and greatness. That's the Bible's primary purpose. When you read it, read it for that. It's not to just gain knowledge. It's not to check off your day's reading. It's to see Christ in all His glory. And believe me, believer, you'll see Him if you're looking for Him, okay? Read to find Christ. Because He's on every page of the Tanakh and on every page of the New Testament. The Bible is all about Yeshua is the Christ. And when we have a knowledge of the Word of God, it keeps us faithful and true. It keeps us on the right path. It's the food that strengthens and encourages us. And Christians are weak today because we know so little about the Word of God. So very little about the Word of God. I hear people spouting, well, the Bible says, I'm like, where in the world does it say that? And that ends the conversation because they don't have a clue because it's not in there. But people, we need to be familiar with the book because it's about Him. And that's the only way you're going to see Him, all right? It's through the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank You, Lord, for Your Word. I pray that You would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord. I pray You'd give us the heart of Bereans that we would search the Scripture, Lord, to see if these things are so. We'd not take this because I'm saying it, but I pray they wouldn't accept it. I pray they also wouldn't reject it, but they'd study it and see if it's so. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have today to have so many avenues to dig into the Word of God, to study the Word of God, to, to find out what it's saying. May we be faithful at doing that, Lord. Amen. Okay, questions, comments. <laughs> Veronica. Um, with that verse that you used about the being awake and being asleep, how do we know that? I know sometimes asleep means dead, so how do we know that's not what that verse was speaking about? Well, it, you have to tell that by the context, okay? The question is, how do we know if the word is used, asleep? Because the word sleep is used, like in 1 Corinthians, it's used, some of you are sickly and some sleep, meaning they're dead. 
All right, so sleep is used for death, but it's also used for, in this sense, not paying attention, not being alert. And you can only tell by the context. It's not a different word. Yeah, it's just you got to tell by the context it's used in. You know, he's not speaking to dead people to wake up because dead people can't wake up unless he wakes them up. Anybody else? We done? I, you know, if I could stress one thing here, I guess it would be this idea of physical punishment, okay, being cut in pieces. I, I really think that's something that we should pay attention to because I think as a Christian, when we walk out of the will of God, we see that. In Matthew 18, the Lord told you know, the believers there, it was, he gave illustrations about forgiveness and how we're to forgive. And we forgive a brother, I don't know how many times. And, and if you don't forgive, he says, I'm going to hand you over to the torturers. And I think that's a vivid picture again of mental instability, of agony, of whatever. So we can suffer physically, we can suffer mentally when we're not where God has called us to be. He has a way of dealing with his children. I don't think he just lets them roam around and, you know, do what they want to do contrary to his will. If they're his, he spanks his own children. He doesn't mess with anybody else's kids. Okay, you get in big trouble for spanking somebody else's kids. You get in trouble today for spanking your own kids, I guess. 